historians and welcome back. Today we will be exploring the early life of King Edward VI. Normally I would say while he was Prince of Wales but Henry VIII never gave Edward the title of Prince of Wales. This is awkward. So it's just going to be while he's Prince Edward. Edward was an extremely precocious child like his sister Elizabeth. He was solemn and serious. He was only known to laugh out loud, I think, once in his life. I don't know how true that is. This was not helped by his father, who was overly protective, and he isolated him from court life, which hindered him from acquiring the social and empathy skills that a human being needs. King Henry VIII was an affectionate but distant father, Edward's own mother died when he was a few days old and the only stepmother to provide him with a stable mother's love was Catherine Parr. Catherine was able to win Edward's affections but she was too late to fix the emotional damage that he had suffered and as such Edward comes across cold and sometimes even heartless. King Edward VI, or as he is at the moment, Prince Edward was born on the 12th of October 1537 at Hampton Court Palace to King Henry VIII and his queen, Jane Seymour. However, he wasn't the only Edward born that day, as his cousin Edward Seymour was also born in another suite at the palace. Henry was elated when Edward was born, as he finally had a legitimate male heir, something that he had been hoping for since 1509. That's just shy of three decades. Breathtaking. I shall call him... Mini me. Edward was christened on the 15th of October 1537 in the Chapel Royal at Hampton Court. Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, the Duke of Norfolk, the Duke of Suffolk, and his sister, the Lady Mary, were assigned as godparents. His sister, the Lady Elizabeth, was carried by Edward's uncle, Edward Seymour, in the procession. She was holding the chrysobal tightly in her small fists. Once baptised and named heir, Edward was conveyed back to the Queen's apartments, followed by his two sisters. Elizabeth walked holding Mary's hand. Edward's mother, Queen Jane Seymour, died from childbirth complications on the 24th of October 1537 at Hampton Court Palace, 12 days after he was born. So Edward never knew his mother and she was buried in St George's Chapel at Windsor Castle on the 12th of November. Edward's father wore black for three months after his mother's death. In May of 1538, Edward was seven months old and his father had spent the whole day playing with his son. Henry carried Edward around in his arms for a long time and held him up to the window for crowds to see the prince. Henry's obsession to protect Edward, to protect his heir, made him sensitive to any hint of treason and that summer, Edward was brought to Hampton Court Palace to be with his sisters. On the 6th of January 1540, King Henry VIII married wife number four, Anne of Cleves, who became Edward's first of many stepmothers. Though she would not last long as his father divorced her on the 12th of July 1540. That was fast. Only to marry his second stepmother, Catherine Howard, days later on the 28th of July 1540. It is unknown what Edward thought of his second stepmother Catherine, as he would have been four when she died. Honestly, I imagine that Prince Edward had little to do with her than the customary pleasantries, and his father at that time seemed to be too interested in his wife than anything else. Henry was paranoid and frightened of illness. After all, the sweating sickness had taken his brother Arthur unexpectedly, as well as both of his sons, Henry, Duke of Cornwall, and Henry Fitzroy, Duke of Richmond. As a result, Henry had the floors and walls of Edward's rooms washed down three times a day with soap to keep him free from disease. To compensate for his absence, Henry showered Edward with gifts and allowed him to indulge in a diet of rich foods. In 1541, a troop of minstrels was appointed to entertain the prince by his father, who was determined to give Edward anything and everything he wanted. Edward also found his education extremely tiresome, despite being a prodigy. So his father had his school books enamelled with gold and set with rubies, sapphires and diamonds. His cutlery was studded with precious stones 
and his napkin sparkled with gold and silver thread. Right. In May 1542, a rumour spread throughout the court that Prince Edward was ill. He wasn't, and it was false. But the shock at the thought of losing the prince prompted Parliament and the Privy Council to remind the King of the need for spare. The November of the same year saw the Battle of Solway Moss. Edward's father, King Henry, was hoping for an alliance between Scotland and England. But Scotland wasn't interested, so Henry thought he could beat them into submission. England won the battle and within days, King James V of Scotland returned to Falklands Palace and died on the 14th of December. With the death of the King of Scots, it meant that his daughter, the six-day-year-old Mary Stuart, was now Queen of Scotland, and King Henry VIII saw this as an opportunity to arrange an alliance between Scotland and England by marrying Edward and Mary. Henry wasted no time and sent envoys to the Queen Regent, Mary of Guise, to lay his proposal for the marriage. On the 1st of January 1543, Edward, now five, performed his first public duty. He entertained the Scottish nobles that were captured at Solway Moss. The Scottish nobles praised him for his conduct, and it was noted how he looked like his mother, the late Queen Jane Seymour. He was fair like Jane, and displayed a cheerful manner like his mother, but facially, he looked like his father. Many would later view Edward as a tyrant like his father too, or at least he had the potential to do so had he not died so early. He's too dangerous to be left alive. 1st of July, 1543, the Treaty of Greenwich was signed which promised at the age of 10, Mary I of Scotland would marry Edward and move to England, where Henry could oversee her upbringing. Quite hilarious in hindsight because obviously Henry wouldn't make it for another 10 years. <laughs> oh, it's funny because it's true. The treaty stipulated that the two countries would remain legally separate and if the couple should fail to have children, the temporary union would dissolve. Similar to the marriage treaty that Edward's sister Mary would have when she married her husband, King Philip II of Spain. 12th of July 1543, Henry married yet again this time to Catherine Parr, who became Edward's third and final stepmother. She was warm and tried to create a family unit. Catherine took an interest in education and had originally overseen Edward's sister, the Lady Elizabeth's education. King Henry was so impressed with Catherine's choice that he then asked for her advice when it came to Edward's education, which started later that year. Like Elizabeth, Edward was to have a rigorous Protestant education and the two would go on to share classes together. Edward would visit court less frequently than his sisters, but his father the king feared that he might catch a disease. This did not stop Catherine from taking an interest in her stepson and eventually he would come to love his stepmother as much as a cold-hearted person like Edward could love anyone. Though, like I said previously, it's not his fault that he turned out this way. The Treaty of Greenwich was rejected in the December of 1543 by the Scottish Parliament. It had been suggested that Prince Edward was not good enough for the Scottish Queen. The cheek, the nerve, the gall, the audacity and the gumption. And they probably didn't like the stipulation of her leaving Scotland. Although they had no problem sending her to France. So I rest my case. As you can imagine, Henry reacted to this rejection quite calmly. Or any normal person would, but Henry, no. Henry was like, you're going to reject me and my son? I'm going to ransack your towns. So he set ablaze Scottish towns that sat on the border. <laughs> you what? This eight-year war between England and Scotland became known as the Rough Wooing. This was England's attempt to secure a marriage alliance with Scotland and I'm sure that setting Scotland's towns and villages alight is the best way to convince anyone to marry you. On the 2nd of August 1545, Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk, died. Charles Brandon was a very close friend of Edward's father, Henry. Charles had left behind a widow and two young sons. The elder son, Henry, was aged 10. He succeeded to the title of Duke of Suffolk and was sent to join the household of Prince Edward. As I mentioned earlier, Edward and Elizabeth's education was strict and rigorous. Edward kept a diary 
and he wrote in his diary that it was to satisfy the good expectation of the king's majesty, my father. From this I get the feeling that Edward was so devoted to his education to impress his father, to get acknowledgement and recognition, something that we also see with Elizabeth both of whom devoted almost every waking hour to books and religious studies. In August 1546, King Henry VIII knew he was dying, and so he sent his son some presents, chains, rings and jewelled buttons. In return, he received this from his son, and I will let you interpret it how you will. You grant me all these, not that I should be proud and think too much of myself, but that you might urge me to the pursuit of all true virtues and piety, and adorn and furnish me with all the accomplishments which are fitting a prince. King Henry VIII dictated his will on the 30th of December 1546. He left his crown and kingdom to Edward and lined out his wish for the line of succession. His will states that after his children, he wants it to go through his sister Mary Tudor's children rather than Margaret's, as they sit on the Scottish throne. Henry made it clear that he does not want a Scot on the throne unless it is as Edward's consort. Edward received portraits of his father and stepmother as New Year's gifts on the 10th of January 1547. He wrote back to Catherine Parr, thanking her for her gifts. His response hints at how he is warming to Catherine as a motherly figure as he calls her the most illustrious queen and dearest mother. What is rather sad is that Edward had no idea how ill his father was at this time. However, both Henry and Catherine had decided to spare him the burden of knowing that his father was dying and that his kingship was imminent. This could be their way of trying to preserve his childhood for as long as they can, as that will be ripped away from him the moment that Henry dies. Although I use the word childhood in its loosest term, Edward's so-called childhood didn't exactly seem much fun. King Henry VIII died on the 28th of January 1547 at Whitehall Palace at the age of 55. Edward was not told of his father's death immediately. Edward was at Hertford Castle when his uncle, Lord Protector, arrived on the 30th of January. He took the young king to Enfield to see his sister Elizabeth, where the two children were informed of their father's passing. Edward was nine and Elizabeth was 13. They cried, and neither of them were consolable. Edward was brought to London on the 31st of January, where he was proclaimed king. Edward was nine when he became king. On the 14th of January, 1547, the body of the late king began its last journey. A coffin that was covered in a cloth of gold, resting on the coffin was a wax effigy of the king, dressed in velvet adorned with precious stones. Banners were carried aloft in the procession, but only two of Henry's six wives were represented, Jane Seymour, Edward's mother, and Catherine Parr. Henry had not considered his other marriages worthy of commemoration. Henry's funeral was on the 6th of February 1547. Henry was laid to rest at Windsor Castle in St George's Chapel, next to Edward's mother, Jane Seymour. At the end of the service, the herald cried, Le Roy est mort. Vive le Roy. The king is dead. Live the king. The young King Edward VI cried and he wrote in his diary, This consoles us that he is now in heaven and that he have gone out of this miserable world into happy and everlasting blessedness. The Regency Council made it clear that Edward would not be allowed to see his stepmother or his sisters as they were jealous of any potential outside influence. Edward missed their company and was upset to learn in the February that Catherine Parr would be retiring to the old manor at Chelsea, to which he wrote, Farewell, venerate queen, as he knew he would rarely see her again. Edward would be crowned king at Westminster Abbey on the 20th of February, 1547. On the eve of his coronation, he led a procession through London from the Tower of London to Westminster Abbey. The procession suddenly stops at St Paul's Cathedral and everyone is confused. Edward had stopped because he saw an acrobat. He was only nine 
He laughed and watched and then continued. And for a boy who was so serious and hardly laugh, that makes this story even more endearing. A special crown had to be made for Edward's coronation, as the St Edward's crown was too big, and the imperial crown was too big and too heavy. He was coronated with the heavy crowns, and then finally switched to the new crown which he wore for the rest of the ceremony. The ceremony was also shortened as the adults were concerned that the boy king would get tired. I hope you enjoyed this look into the early life of King Edward VI, the boy king. If you did, please leave a like, subscribe and watch another. But until the next one, have a wonderful day.